like to welcome first um, our honorable ministers from the Kingdom of Eswatini. Honorable Minister of Justice and Constitutional Affairs, accompanied by the Principal Secretary for Justice and Constitutional Affairs. Honorable Minister of Sports, Culture and Youth Affairs, and the Principal Secretary of and the Ministry of Labor and Social Security. The Chief Inspector of Secondary Schools, the Chief Immigration Officer, the Regional Educational Officer for Hoho, the Secretary for Training, Localization, and the Migration Committee. I would also like to welcome the Honorable High Commissioner of the United Kingdom and Great Britain. Thank you. And I would like also to welcome all of us, uh, all of you who are joining us online. I hope you can hear me. We have members of the Stern family, Martin Stern and Judy Stern, members of the Dalverton Trust, chair and members of the Waterford School Trust, chair and members of the Waterford Foundation of South Africa, friends of Waterford in the USA, and all the donors around the world who join us. Trevor Tutu, thank you for being here. Heads of the UWC movement and former heads of Waterford Kamklava. The chair of the UWC movement and the chief executive are also online. We have the chair and members of our governing council and ex-chair of our governing council and the media. Distinguished guests, students, parents, staff, both present staff and former, alumni and friends of Waterford Kamklava. A special mention I'd like to make to Mrs. Claudia Gambe, Dr. Gambe's mother, who has flown here from Zimbabwe to attend. Thank you. We have here leaders who come from a unique institution and who have been instrumental in charting the course of history, having taken full advantage of the educational experience of Waterford Kamklawa in order to lead societal change, to struggle for social justice and peace, and to question and hold us all accountable to the highest standards of human endeavor. Our alumni, former staff, present students and teachers, friends and families of our Kamklawa community continue to work to make education a force for change towards a more just, equitable, and peaceful world. And here I'd like to just mention that the United World Colleges and the Waterford Kamplawa is one of 18 of the United World Colleges, has this week been nominated by the Nobel Committee for the Peace Prize. I thank Dr. Alban Gambe, our history teacher and director of residences, for also being a first. One who, through his work and his study and his writing, has brought our past, our legacy, as the first purposefully racially integrated school of Southern Africa, in complete opposition to the experiment of apartheid in South Africa, towards our present century, full of challenges and opportunities, as we continue to look for new models, thoughts, and ideas to help address the widening gaps in every area of education today. Our gendered, racial, and economic diversity will provide some divergent but bold solutions towards a more socially just future for all. Waterford Kamklawa is excited to be part of the Kingdom of Eswastini's national development strategy to promote sustainable economic development, social justice, and political stability. 
We too at Waterford continue to contribute through our educational project in which the development of skills, knowledge, and a sense of purpose to provide leadership in both Africa and the rest of the world continues to be the touchstone that guides us. Thank you all for being here this evening. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Michael Stern was one of the most influential educationalists since the Second World War. A conservative with radical beliefs, he enjoyed a distinguished career in Britain before and after his pioneering work in Southern Africa. Revolted by the racial discrimination and segregation in South Africa, he set out to create a multiracial school that would allow for education between children of all races here in Eswatini. This was the first multiracial school in Southern Africa and also happens to be the school I get to call home for the next two years. A campus that lives out Mr. Stern's dream every day, a place where diversity is not only the color of our skin, but nationalities, cultures, backgrounds, and so much more. Today we have the privilege of learning and hearing from Dr. Gambe, who did research on institutional response to apartheid and colonial rule with a focus on the contributions of Waterford Kamshaba to the apartheid fight. This is a special honor for me because Dr. Gambe is my current history teacher and part of the major reason why I excel as a historian. In the classroom setting, not only does he help cultivate my love for history and push me as a learner, but also make me genuinely enjoy the time I spend learning with and from him. Outside the classroom, Dr. Gambe is also head of the junior hostel as well as head of residences. And living there in Agukuleni with him from 2017 to 2019 was um, interesting, to say the least. From threatening bread duty to playing sports with us on the field and telling the worst dad jokes, Dr. Gambe has become more than a teacher to me, but a father figure as well. So it is my absolute pleasure to introduce to you, ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Alban Gambe. Um, let me start by uh, making some corrections on the way we are calling Michael Stern. Michael Stern was Dr. Michael Stern. So I think we should make that uh, as we start this lecture. So Dr. Michael Stern also say Michael Stern. Um, I will explain that as I come to close so that it's clear for us to understand. It's a great honor for me uh, to be in front of you, really, uh, to deliver this speech and this lecture uh, concerning a man who took great strides in trying to bring in more racialism in education and that project developing further into different spheres of the social and political uh, justice systems that we see today and that we yearn for as a college and when we look at the UWC, I mean colleges, that's basically uh, where this whole idea uh, resonates. It's an honor for me. Why? Because the history of this institution and the history of Michael Stern, uh, for me, it's a history that I've tried to put and compress into a small volume of my, my nine chapters in my work, but I think there's more to it. And just like um, Tony Hatton said in Phoenix Rising, he finishes his work by passing on the baton to the next person who is gonna take this history up. And this is what really motivated me to write on the history of the school and obviously 
that collided with the works of Michael Stern uh, in that history. So today, I'm quite excited, as my principal mentioned, uh, to have quite a number of guests that have graced the school, and again to have uh, my mother being here with, with us to witness this momentous occasion on the centenary celebrations and um, the history that I'm going to share with you today. So on my lecture, I've just put it into themes. Um, I know my students who are here would always want to know uh, when they're writing, what is it that you want to put across? So I've tried to put this into four themes so that we might, uh, at the end, be able to go back and ask ourselves, uh, what were we talking about? What did we learn from this um, lecture, as it were? So I've looked at the first theme based on my title there, Education for Political Change, Profile of Pioneer. I've started with the pioneering aspect. Um, and the second theme that I've tried also to bring across is to look at the Stenian philosophy. So in my work, I've tried by all means to define what Sten was trying to bring across. And to me, that brought me to what I've called the Stenian philosophy of education. So this is going to be illustrated uh, in the next, I mean, the second theme that looks at uh, the Stenian philosophy of education for social justice. My third theme is going to be on Stenian's philosophy for education for political change, which, are, which is also illustrated um, on the uh, slides as we go. And lastly, I will then look at the impacts of the Stenian philosophy, uh, which might also resonate with what is happening uh, today. So let me start by giving you sort of a very short background um, to Michael Stern's um, life. Sorry about that. So, is he is the first sort of uh, British expatriate to respond to the cause for a social and political just system that is affecting students and black uh, South Africans in South Africa, and tries to follow through uh, with finding out what is happening through his um, readings of the Observer, that is uh, featuring articles by Father Hardostone. I think some of you, us who have uh, gone through the history of South Africa, we remember Father Hardostone for his efforts uh, in trying to fight for uh, blacks who had been moved by the Group Editors Act in Sophia Town. So he's, he's the priest that is quite close to Michael Stern, as uh, shown on my slide there. And it is this man that brings in Stern to the ills of uh, the apartheid state. And he stays uh, in Johannesburg, um, heads one of the schools there, St. Peter's, and by the time that this school has to close because of the Group Areas Act and the Boundary Education Act, this leads him to look elsewhere. And it is from there that you might want to ask what was his conviction? What was uh, really making him want to take on this journey? So Michael Linden does uh, put uh, us through to look into what was happening in Michael, uh, Michael Stern's thinking. And he says, uh, for those who knew him, there can be no doubt that Michael Stern's values, ideals, and actions arose from a devout, if not always completely conventional Christian faith. Uh, and it is that Christian faith that is also uh, making him come in uh, contact with uh, Father Trevor Hardostone. And it is from this that uh, he has a passion for social justice and obviously, at the end, it is it that brought him to want to see change uh, with what was happening in South Africa. So he goes, um, Lyndon gave me a very good narrative of uh, the life of Michael Stern and emphasized again uh, quite a number of issues that uh, he was very much interested in. And this is what brought him into contact with Swaziland at the end, because he felt that he could actually start a new order in Swaziland, where by then, um, the 1960s, there was obviously a gap for him to explore um, new areas in trying to bring 
a just education system. So, when we go back to the first theme that I've outlined, it is important for us uh, to go back to the pioneer aspect that I have tried to emphasize, and this is around him being able to start the first multiracial school uh, in exile, and this is um, a first of its kind in that uh, this school that he starts in 1963 is a school that has not been found anywhere in Africa and, and most um, of Europe, in that he's bringing in uh, young people together that are coming from different nationalities and backgrounds, and out of that, he is already, as we can see, trying to look into the future of what is happening in South Africa. So this, if I look back into my literature review, I did compare and checked to see some of the institutions that might have been trying uh, to do the same thing. For example, you have the Solomon Mashangu's um, Freedom School that is established in Tanzania by the ANC. And when you look at such examples of uh, exile schools, uh, you then get challenged to want to know what is the difference that we can see when you look at my Stern's um, new project. The difference is quite clear. Him, um, his project is basically a multiracial uh, institution, unlike the other institutions that we see in South Africa where probably they are only giving education uh, to the blacks. So, this leads him to really look into how best uh, he could describe what education that he wanted to give to the uh, young people that he had brought together and obviously propel his ideology. So in that, uh, he gives a very good analogy and I loved uh, reading this, it's also found, uh, if you read uh, Phoenix Rising, you'll find this uh, very interesting analogy that he gives. He talks of um, a vendor who is selling um, uh, hydrogen fueled balloons and he has got different colors of these balloons. But what strikes a young man is that when he looks at the red one, the yellow one, the green one, and a white balloon, all are sailing in the air. But for the young man, the one that is still not going up there is the black balloon. And he does ask a question. He asks the question around how far can this black balloon go up? Does it need to be propelled to go up? Does it need you to help it to go up? And from this, Michael Stern brings in a very important aspect of what he felt the education that he was given should give. He says, it is the stuff inside that is the concern of education. And as a teacher and a historian, I would want to look at how best as teachers, how best as educationists, are we able to make sure that we can work with the staff inside. What are the barriers that might be coming to us as we try to teach our students? And to my question, we need to make sure that we don't look into those barriers and probably concentrate on the staff that is inside. And this is going to promote, as he says, clear thinking and a kindly feeling toward other people, which means education has the power to propel young people, to give young people an opportunity to challenge themselves and also bring them towards each other through those connections that we see a lot in schools. So that's the first sort of idea that comes to me when I want to uh, look at the pioneering aspect. The second aspect uh, that also comes within this space uh, is the rainbow nation. So the concept of the rainbow nation comes out clearly in 1994 when we talk of South Africa after its independence. But through my research, I did make a point then that with Michael Stern's um, motivation and abilities, he is already preparing you Waterford as a dress rehearsal for what is going to happen in 1994. Through his works, he is able to bring young people coming from different backgrounds, coming from different races, coming from different nationalities, and these are brought together. And out of that, his aim is to make sure that education is able to unite these people, is able to unite these young people, and they must carry that forward. So in 1967, when King Sobuza visits the school, he makes a very important statement by calling this school Kamshaba, the earth. And he says it brings all races together, as was being done at Waterford. So 
to the students that were in the school, his message was quite clear. He says to them, it is for you now to go and put into practice what you have seen and what you have lived and seen here at this school. When you go out into the world, do practice what you have seen at this school. So his emphasis is that this project should actually be able to have an impact into the world, should have an, have an impact from where these young people are coming from, because it is them that are going to go on with the message that they've been uh, taken through, uh, through the school. So that's the first sort of theme that I thought I should um, emphasize first, the pioneering, pioneering aspect, that Michael State pioneers are a very important aspect uh, of um, understanding each other and young people being the church bearers uh, of racial harmony, church bearers uh, of um, an understanding of a better world. So the second theme that I'm uh, going to share to you now uh, is him questioning colonial education, which I've said education for social justice. So it starts with the stuff that he brings in. So we have people like um, Linden. I'm happy that he was able to join. Um, he had uh, also asked, uh, I mean, apologize that you couldn't come here because of health, but uh, he's able to attend that this lecture. I'm very happy to, to be sharing this as well with him. So he shared to me some very interesting aspect of the stuff that uh, Michael Stein brought together. Uh, he brings in the idea of them sharing and being able to, wanting to see uh, and share the vision of uh, Michael Stein. He does say, uh, back then, in the 1960s, 70s, uh, they earned around five pounds per month. Uh, they, uh, the the five, um, five pound was pocket money, and no one complained about it. Even when our salaries went up, he says, teachers were used to donating half of that to the school. So to me, <clears throat> that brings a vision that is shared, and having people who are able to look into that vision and share that vision, and it was through Michael Stern's efforts that he was able to have teachers who would understand, even when it left uh, the school, a number of teachers that also graced the school had the same sort of thinking uh, around how they could make sure that uh, the school could actually propel forward. The idea of a social and just uh, sort of education coming out first with the members of staff, and we are going to see also uh, how the students would uh, look into that. So, he also, um, obviously, after he left, uh, recruitment went on, and uh, Rob Robin Mullen was also to become one of the teachers teaching his, I mean, um, English. And one of the most interesting things that I would want to emphasize when you look at uh, Robin Mullen is the issue of the, the, the curriculum. So when Michael Stern and the founders started the school, uh, they obviously implemented the Cambridge curriculum, but with time, there was quite a number of questions that were being asked around, how do we make sure that we have a decolonized curriculum? So it was through the efforts of Robin Malan uh, that we see some changes. So he says, uh, in the early years of his teaching, he realized something that was happening in Africa in the 1960s and 1970s. There was a rise in African literature. And most of this literature um, you can name uh, some of the early writers there, Chinua Chebez. There wasn't much that was being put into syllabi um, in English literature. So Robin Mullen writes to, the, to Cambridge, and he does um, make some suggestions on the English syllabus, and says, can you allow me, with this school, to have some adjustments done to the literature Cambridge curriculum? And he says, that letter went and he was quite anxious about it because he expected something that might be negative. But to his surprise, Cambridge allowed for these adjustments to be done. So he says that is when um, some of these works came into uh, the Cambridge curriculum on the African literature perspective. Uh, an example, Woman Walk in the Night, Nadine Godma, Sam Mandel for the Jewel, Doris Lessing, uh, this was the old chief's country. After Fugard, I think some IB students here would bring literature of Norma, more single verse dead. Robin Malan himself had a combination of Southern African poems. Uh, Louis uh, Bernardo Honwana with Cute the Munch Dog. Charles Mingoshi waiting for the rain. Uh, Chinua Chebe no longer it is. 
So this African text had something that was quite important and significant. For example, if you look at Alex Guma's work, uh, A Walk in the Night, it covers basically his personal experiences and those of non wise under the apartheid system. And himself had also been involved in the struggle against apartheid. So it's actually giving the young students a feel of what is happening within uh, the African context uh, in this colonial era. Then Lessing writes on the effects of colonization on Zimbabwe, uh, southern Rhodesia by then. And um, you also look at uh, Onuana's work on the Portuguese um, uh, works I mean, in, um, in Mozambique. Uh, you also look at Arthur Fugat, uh, who is um, looking at his work as a law clerk, and he makes sure that he writes about uh, what is happening within his sphere, particularly the issues of identity and uh, the cutting of uh, pass, uh, that the passes that was uh, required of uh, non whites in South Africa. So this uh, sort of gave me a very good sort of understanding of what the Stenian philosophy on um, social justice through education uh, brought again within the school circles with students being uh, able to open up and be opened up to understand what is happening uh, in the region and beyond. So this prompted some of the students that were in the school, for example, Dubak Tubule, um, he comments on the teachers saying, what about teachers <clears throat> make sure that uh, they applied the content to what was happening around us? The history of art, um, and the history teacher, for example, made regular connection of our history uh, with uh, what was happening in South Africa and also uh, beyond the borders uh, of, of Swaziland and South Africa. And this also shows really uh, the effort that were being put by uh, uh, the teachers, all I would say uh, borrowing from the CNN philosophy of uh, social justice. The next aspect of uh, this social justice uh, through education can also be looked through the lenses of a community service. So Waterford, by the time uh, it opened in 1963, construction of the school was still happening. And what was quite interesting with all that uh, was how Sten looked at the students and how they could contribute. So most of the students were involved in the building of the school. They were also <clears throat> looking ahead to wanting to see what uh, this school will become because of their involvement. Um, it is also through those works of students being able to take part uh, in the building of the school, that leads uh, to a community service uh, that happens um, down over the uh, Sidwashini there, where the students are also involved uh, in the construction of Tedu Caesar Primary School in the I mean, late 1970s. And out of that, students were able to really see some of those projects um, happening and being part of that. Besides that, we could also look at students um, being involved uh, with what, uh, what is called the Kwetsembeni I mean, um, uh, Center, which is in Babane, where there are um, students with disabilities. And this also started uh, quite early in the school uh, with students being able to go and help um, in different ways at the center. And students were also involved uh, with the Babane Government Hospital back then. And this saw them uh, visiting uh, Ward 8, which we still do even today. And out of it, uh, students could also take uh, some of the children from Ward 8 uh, to the uh, Ward Springs in, in Ezruini and uh, in different areas. Again, uh, to as sort of avenues of making sure that the students uh, could also get uh, a turnout. So from this, the social justice aspect that I've uh, emphasized is my second theme. Um, what comes out clear then is we see a man who is dedicated in seeing social change, social justice, because if these students are taken out there, um, out of their own comfort zones, then they're able to really understand how the communities around them are faring, and out of that, they can actually be able to uh, give a hand uh, in different ways. The third theme that I want to put across is what I've called the Stadium uh, Philosophy of Education for Political Justice. So, 
When Stan started the school and the project, there were a lot of questions that were asked him, to him about this institution. And one of the questions that was asked, I mean, in the 1960s and 70s, was whether Waterford was a political institution. To him, it wasn't. He does say Waterford is no way a political institution. Therefore, it is every hope of survival in Africa, black, white, or coffee, or colored. We are simply building a small bridge which young people can cross if they wish, and we find they do. So this statement uh, and the events that I'm going to share with you sort of gave me a bit of a debate when I was looking into it. Because at first, we are seeing an institution that is obviously at the borders with South Africa where apartheid is happening. And at the same time, we have an institution that is obviously answering to what is happening in South Africa in a way. And it does say this is in no way political. But what are the events that are going to happen from there? So we have the 1976 Soweto uprisings, and that led to the Soweto massacres. And this obviously was broadcast to the world. I think most of you are familiar with the Hector Peterson uh, picture that became um, news all over the world. Um, this became a very, very important uh, commemoration event at Waterford. So from 1976, accounts that I got from some of our interviews uh, was that students were able to march from the school and go to the Oshuk border post, and they were able to hand in a petition to the South African official at the border. Secondly, the students organized themselves, and they even looked at fasting in solidarity with families in Soweto. So they would do a fast, as shown there, uh, this was a voluntary thing. They would uh, either fast in the morning or they would fast in the afternoon. They would choose a meal that they think they can fast on. And then they would ask the accounts office then to work out all the money from uh, the meals that have been missed. And that money was sent to Papa Desmond Tutu, who would then distribute that to the families in Soweto. So the solidarity brings um, quite a lot of um, interesting aspects especially in Swaziland itself uh, and in South Africa, because some of the students that are in the school are from South Africa, and they are bringing these ideas, and they want to see change, and they also influence the students that are around. Uh, some were not from South Africa, but they started understanding and realizing, because again, they would also have, um, uh, students uh, would also have um, memorials where they would do a memorial assembly, and then out of that came some students who became quite vocal and also quite involved in this. So I have uh, Zola Maseko, we have uh, singled out. There are quite a number that are in my work. Uh, if you get a chance to look at my work, you see quite a number of uh, students were involved. But I've singled out Zola Maseko. Why? Because uh, what happened to Zola Maseko's um, <clears throat> I mean, issue is we have a student who is coming from a family that is obviously very active in politics. Uh, his father was an exiled ANC member, yet um, <clears throat> He was living in Mark Keynes, and that's how um, they were able to, to start sort of organizing with students. So he was the one who was able then to have some of the students from the school uh, to also understand what was happening in South Africa by bringing, them to, uh, bringing the students uh, to his home. But one, one turning point was when uh, his father was now appointed the um, principal of Solomon Matlangu's um, uh, school in Tanzania, and he had to leave the school. So he left the school um, the, in the late 1980s and goes on to um, learn at um, he goes on to learn at uh, the Solomon Matangu uh, School, and in there he says he was able to get to understand more uh, in terms of what was happening uh, in the country, uh, South Africa, where he, where he was, I mean, where he was coming from, and he then comes back to the school. Um, to do his IB studies. So when he comes to the school, this was in 1986, he's the first person, uh, as noted by uh, several uh, people interviewed, who was able then to start the commemorations, I would say, change those commemorations to become more active. And it was him who then brought in the whole idea of uh, the night vigils or the day vigils, as they were called. Students would go on Mount Tom, 
uh, they would uh, assemble there, and most of it uh, was in solidarity with what's happening in South Africa. He brought new songs, he says, uh, he brought uh, some kind of dance, he, he, uh, you name it. And out of that, uh, there was sort of a change in the whole movement. And he does share again that uh, in one of the commemorations, uh, probably the 1986 one, it was even to the extent that the police got involved because they heard the noise that was happening uh, at Waterford and they also came in, they wanted to know what was happening. And he does share that uh, it was quite a very anxious moment for them uh, to be um, seeing police coming, but as students who were quite motivated to stand for what they believed, uh, they continued um, even the following year when they had been uh, taught to stop uh, the commemorations. Then we have also some students, we also have some students who were quite involved uh, because of uh, what was happening in South Africa to the extent that uh, from the school they went and joined uh, the MK, um, the arm wing of the ANC. So Zola Maseko is also one of them. He went and, um, he went and um, got involved uh, with the um, MK branch here in, in, in Swaziland. Uh, we have uh, quite a number of uh, students that are also, uh, were also quite active that they also uh, took part uh, in uh, joining the MK as, uh, as it were. The next thing that I thought I would also share with you on this uh, is uh, to look at um, the solidarity that students of Waterford uh, also got themselves involved uh, through the sports boycotts. So sports boycotting became a very big feature in South Africa in the 1980s, I think, uh, from your, uh, some of uh, the readings, you might also uh, be aware of how uh, in solidarity uh, South Africa was not allowed to join the Olympics. Uh, in solidarity, South African teams were banned to go into uh, different areas. And in, at Waterford, this became a very, very debated topic. The issue was, are we going to allow South African teams to come and play with us here? Are we going to allow our teams to go and play in South Africa? And most of the students uh, felt um, indifferent about having uh, to go to South Africa. So in the end, polls had to be done. So out of the polls, most students were okay with South African teams coming uh, to join in sporting activities with Waterford here. So I talked to Andy Foos and he tried to explain that whole um, understanding around it. So he says for him and other students, what was particular important, of particular importance was to try and show the students that are coming from South Africa, and hopefully they will also share with their families the racial harmony that they would find when they come and visit and play with us. He says there were different teams that would come uh, to the school and they would have an opportunity to actually have uh, those students play uh, with their teams here. And that understanding is what they felt uh, the South African teams, uh, the South African students, South African parents uh, had to understand. So for example, they wanted to find out, for example, how the, um, uh, the parents would also react to them coming to a school where uh, the races were mixed. And for him, he felt that this was quite an opportunity uh, for the students to showcase Waterford to the world to say, this is a place where the ills of apartheid are actually uh, showing up by making sure that they bring uh, the races together. So now I want to take you through the impact of the Stenian philosophy, which is my last theme uh, tonight. So I did look at uh, Michael Sten's life, and one thing that was uh, quite interesting for me was his ideas from an early stage when he comes to South Africa, when he ends up in Switzerland. And I did then look at my, on my chapter eight, I look at how that is going to be interconnected to the point that we end up with a nexus that we can find really a strong one between Waterford, Kamklaba, and the UWC um, ideas. So Kate Hane, for example, was so much disturbed about what had happened in World War II, and he felt that there was need to start some schools that would actually bring young people together. Hence, the Atlantic College. It opens in 1962, and Waterford is accepted into the uh, UWC in 1963, I mean in 1983. So you would find that the opening of Waterford in 1963 and the starting of Atlantic in 1962, I found that quite interesting 
Because to me, it means these ideas that Stan was already looking into, that Stan came and uh, started here, were already out there, but he had had that idea already to be the one who would also start it in this region. So I found that quite interesting, and that is why at the end, Waterford was easily accepted into the um, UWC um, uh, institution. And one of the students commenting on this move, uh, Aiden Yakuze, does uh, look at this um, as something that is quite significant. He says it was an extension of the founding mission, a world in miniature, but extended to all global stage and on more global issues, which is what we <clears throat> obviously uh, look towards our students today, equality, climate change, human rights. Uh, more broadly, he says, joining the UWC boosted workers contemporary relevance regionally and globally. It proved YK with an ongoing living legacy by making it relevant. And that is the debate uh, that happens in the 1980s, late 1980s, uh, when signs were coming that apartheid one day would fall. The debate that was happening within this Waterford community, most stakeholders felt that there was a need really to look beyond what was happening in South Africa post the 90s. So, that is one of the first aspects that I would say uh, we can also talk of when we look at the impact of uh, the Stenian uh, philosophy that I've shared with you. Uh, the second thing is how Michael Stern himself is honored. So in 1999, Michael Stern is awarded an honorary degree by the University of Sussex. And it is quite crucial to understand the messaging of the speech that is given on that night. The college does say, Waterford is a shining beacon, or was a shining beacon in a dark period of South Africa's history. This is 1999, South Africa is independent. And the life of Stan was described as an inspiring record of dedication to humanity. So for me, that's quite a very huge impact as seen by the work of Michael Stan. And in the end, uh, this gave a, obviously a new impetus to him uh, as an individual and uh, the works that he did even uh, post Waterford are also a very clear uh, evidence to him understanding uh, the needs of our societies. The other thing that I also saw, thought uh, is quite crucial is to also look at the recognition that the school receives uh, from different anti-apartheid activists who are able to visit the school. In 1991, for example, Nelson Mandela himself came to the school um, and thanked the school for having been uh, a refuge for his uh, children, for his daughters, who came to the school and did their education here. The Sicilu is shown in the picture. It's not very clear, I can see. But they also thanked the school for having been, again, a place of comfort for their daughter who had also come to the school. We also have um, Papa Desmond Tutu, who also came to the school and also um, made the same sort of similar comments in understanding what the school had done uh, for his family. So for me, coming to the close of this lecture, is to appreciate really the work that has been done by the college, the work that the college continues to do, the partnerships uh, that the college has always had uh, with the Swiss government, the partnership that the college has always had uh, with the different other organizations uh, in and out of Africa. For the sake, as um, our advance, advancement officer did say, of making sure that students can get comfort in getting to better opportunities in their lives uh, in school. As I come to a close, I would want to also mention uh, a number of people that have made um, this day a success, and in my writing also very important. I would want to thank the school administration for allowing me to have this opportunity. Uh, the advancement office, um, especially Liz, Panel, and Manuba, they were very, very crucial in trying to make that this thing can work today. I think you saw the glitches that we started with but uh, we were able to conquer in the end. Uh, Mike Linden, <coughs> Robin Malan, Alan Whiteside, and Noah Ngambule, I think I've seen Mr. Ngambule here. Um, Michael Jarvis, Catherine Hunter, uh, Dumag Kubule, Zola Maseko, Andy Fuss, Aiden Yakuze, uh, Ramira Patel, the Lauri family, my family also here present. I really appreciate uh, the work uh, that um, you have also put in helping me to get to this opportunity. Thank you.
So um, we thank you all for watching. Thank you, Mr. Kambi, for a lovely lecture. And unfortunately, due to time, we are going to have to skip the Q&A. And I assume this is the first time most of you are seeing me. My name is Oyanko Sisikudla, and I am an IB1. And I have been moderating on this side on the Zoom aspect of this hybrid speaker series. So we are going to skip the Q&A, unfortunately. But if you do have any questions, keep them and then we'll send them through to Mr. Gambe and see if we can answer them through email, um, making no promises though. Um, so we are moving on now and I would like to introduce um, Mr. Michael Jarvis here on Zoom from the Waterford School Trust to give a few remarks. Thank you so much everyone for bearing with us through the technical difficulties and enjoy the rest of the evening. Good afternoon, um, can people hear me? Great. Um, I'm Michael Jarvis. I was a volunteer at Waterford for a year from September 1969. And I've been associated with the Waterford School Trust in the UK close on 50 years. Inevitably, I saw a lot of Michael, if only because at, at Waterford, uh, if only because about six bachelor members of staff would eat together of an evening. And when he returned to the UK and moved to North London, my wife and I saw a lot of him uh, regularly over about five years until he moved in the direction of Hampshire. I would like to offer two vignettes, one about my initial experience of what Waterford was all about and stood for, and then I'll mention an experience I shared with Michael in 1980. So back in September 1969, I was asked within a few days of my arrival to drive the school bus to collect about 15 students traveling from Johannesburg to Brayton, about 20 miles across the border, and the closest that South African rail came to then Swaziland. When the train arrived, the black students came off one end, I think it was the back, the white students came off the other end, and the Indians from the middle. They then climbed into the bus in exactly the same formation. But once we had gone through passport control at Oshock and set off, I turned round and all the colours were mingled. My other vignette is around a visit which Michael Stern and I made to Southern Africa in 1980. At the time, Michael was banned, uh, but he had been granted permission to spend a short period in Johannesburg before traveling on to Swaziland. The main purpose of stopping off in Joburg was for Michael to meet some lost friends of the school and seek to revive their interest. One morning, we went to see Desmond Tutu, whose interest did not need um, reviving, who was then Secretary of South African Council of Churches. He had, of course, been a parent, and I'd met him during my year when they came to visit Trevor. The, meet, the meeting was of limited value because as soon as we arrived, the flamboyant Archbishop-to-be enacted something like a game of charades with him dancing around his office and pointing to the ceiling. We finally worked out that what he was telling us was the office was bugged so that we had to talk about rather sort of, sort of sweet nothings, certainly nothing of the sort Michael Stern would have liked to um, start it off on. Very chilling. May I personally congratulate Alban both on completing his dissertation and thank him for speaking to us today. It has been absolutely fascinating. Could I also just drop a few names um, because it's, uh, I, I recognize a lot of names in the list of participants, um, but could I just mention a few students who were there in 1969-70? Um, Alistair Cameron Smith, uh, Marion Schlapperbersky, David Schlapperbersky, Robin Chase. Robin was one of the first girls to be taken into the school and has achieved a very 
high profile in the business world globally. Um, Alan Whiteside, Quinton Reisman, also, and, and two members of staff, I think I've spotted uh, Lindsay Wentworth, who was a mu music teacher, and Mike Linden, who did an awful lot of things. In fact, I think he took over. Did he take over? As no, he didn't. Never mind. Um, and can I also pay salams to two great UK birth based supporters of the school, Dame Mary Richardson and Sir Mark Moody Stewart? Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mr. Jarvis. And now I will be handing over to our wonderful WK Governing Council Chair, Dr. Sbongile Gumbi. Thank you. Thank you. Um, good morning, afternoon, and evening. To everyone who has joined the Gamshaba community today to mark the start of the Waterford Gamshaba Lecture Series and acknowledge 100 years since the birth of the school's founder, Michael Stern. We truly appreciate the attendance of each one of you, whether in person or virtually. Of course, we wouldn't be Gamshlaba if we didn't have people streaming in from across the globe. Online, I see many familiar names. I will not expose my age by mentioning any one of the names that I recognize. I also respectfully and gratefully welcome all our official guests that, that Patricia kindly welcomed on behalf of the Waterford Gamshaba School. I present myself to you all as the Chair of the Governing Council of the School. Before I go into my main comments, I'd like to thank Dr. Gambe, my African brother from another father, who, know who knows whether Gambe and Gumbi were not ancestral brothers brothers. Dr. Gambe, I thank you so much for your historic account of Waterford and Kachlava and for taking us through the world that existed during Michael, Michael Stern's time that compelled him to start the school and for the story of our past to the present. I'd also like to thank um, Michael Jarvis for his own personal account. I'm so cognizant of how often a wealth of history sits in people's minds. And I'm grateful that this session is being recorded because we are capturing crucial history through his story. The Waterford we know today, and many of us have experienced for the last 60 years, is the outcome of the vision, courage, and conviction of an ordinary person who felt compelled enough to act in response to a need he identified in an imperfect world. I don't believe that Michael one day woke up thinking, well, today I'm going to make a difference in the world and impact the lives of many. He strikes me as a man who acted and committed himself to a cause against injustice, simply doing what he can under the circumstances and within his means. Such simple acts of doing, solving and accomplishing led to outputs, outcomes, impacts and eventually legacy. As we gather to celebrate the beginnings of our school, let's be reminded that history is created in the present and that we have a duty to future generations to create the best present moments that they can experience in the world we share. Like any family, we at Kamshlava have several anniversaries and family celebrations that are planned to bring us together. I'd like to share that share with our alumni, especially from South Africa, of a special event planned for February 24th by the Waterford Gamshlava Foundation of South Africa. Details will follow in the coming weeks. Unfortunately, I can't let on on what is planned, but trust me, you'll not regret rekindling or strengthening your connections with the school. And later, we also uh, will be celebrating the school's 60th uh, birthday celebration. And again, there's a lot of excitement to look forward to on that occasion. Each one of us gathered here today have our individual experiences of this special school. As a chair of the governing council, I'd like to assure you that Waterford will continue to be a beacon of excellence, a place that promotes cultural diversity, an institution where our students will develop the skills, 
knowledge and sense of purpose to fulfill their highest aspirations and our own hopes for them to provide conscious leadership both in Africa and the world. I'd like to end with a quote by the late Archbishop Emeritus Desmond Tutu, or Arch as we fondly refer to him, who said, and I quote, do your little bit of good where you are. It's those little bits of good put together that overwhelm the world, unquote. I'd like to believe that the beginnings of the school are the result of a little bit of good that the likes of Michael Stern, Stern And here I would like to emphasize the good that many others who've, who we've not mentioned acknowledged have done to make Water for Kamshava the school that it is today and will be tomorrow. And I thank you. Good evening, everyone. After almost seven years at Waterford Gump Laba, it is still so exhilarating and encouraging to be a part of these amazing events and to see our teachers growing and learning alongside us. An honorable mention to my Form 3 history teacher, Dr. Gambe. I think as students, we don't often think about the history of the spaces we occupy. And it is in times like these where we come together at, and take pride as one whole in our school, its beginnings, and our movement. I personally have learned so much about our history this evening, and it brings so much meaning and appreciation to being a part of this community. We would love to give a big thank you to, of course, Dr. Gambe, our honorable guests, the Stern family, Waterford School, Trust, Waterford Gamplaba Foundation of South Africa, American Friends of Waterford Gamplaba, the Governing Council, Gamplaba alumni, donors and sponsors, parents, staff, and obviously the students. And on behalf of Dr. Angoy, I would like to invite you all to join us for refreshments in the CCLD after Owen Corsi's closing remarks. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us at our speaker series. Thank you so much for bearing with, the with us with the technical difficulties. It's been a difficult day, but we hope you learned a lot. And just as we have also learned a lot, thank you so much, Dr. Gambe. And to our honorable guests, we are delighted to have you here. And just as Eileen said that um, there are refreshments. And if you are on Zoom, thank you so much for bearing with us. And we're always so delighted to have you attending our speaker series. Please do come back for more and we'll we will keep you posted on the following speaker series. And have a great evening from me, Owen Corsi, who is in IB2. Um, it's a hot day, and I might have said I'm in IB1. I've henceforth graduated to IB2. Um, just letting you know that I've transitioned, and this is my final year that Blunder was made of. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining, and we hope you all have a great evening. And if you are on Zoom, we will keep the Zoom open for a few minutes just so you can mingle and talk to people that you are familiar with. Thank you so much for attending and keep your eyes posted for the next speaker series. And from all of us, it's good night. Thank you so much.